Well, hello everybody. Great hello. to see you all. There's four of us here, by the way, for this event. Socially distanced, might I add. But this is the first live stream event from Sustainable Wales this year. Um, this is the green room. We're holding it in the green room. So if you haven't been, you'll have to find out and come and we can do live events. Um, <clears throat> we decided um, to um, ask people to indulge this evening and get themselves sell some fair trading, something nice from the fair trade selection. Um, wine, we've been having wine. Chocolate brownies, we've got some chocolate for later on as well. We're going to have tea and coffee, whatever we want afterwards. But it felt appropriate for us to do this um, because it's just been fair trade fortnight and we've been unable to contribute. So this is our little gesture to contribute, hoping that the people who watch partake of some fair trade goodies themselves. Because, um, you know, to support developing countries, the pharmacy producers and their families so that they have a more secure income, a, more, a little bit better than they would have income. It's not fantastic. But we want you to realize that you've got influence with your purse, the power of the purse, that you can be a responsible consumer and not only do the fair trade, good things, but be eco-friendly. Because that, the, that is a big feature of the work that we do in Sustainable Wales, as well as we were, of course, extremely interested in, in culture and and. Um, having that opportunity to be involved, be participate locally or even internationally at times in um, artistic activity. So, so I hope you enjoy tonight. I'm looking forward to it. I will be handing over to Robert Minhinick, who I know will present um, some of his own work and introduce our guests. Um, and think there's going to be an interval, so you'll be able to take hold of coffee and tea and drinks then as well yourselves. So over to you, Robert. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, we're here tonight to celebrate the pre-launch of Phil Cope's latest volume, The Golden Valley, all to do with Blind Garrow, The Garrow Valley, which appears from the publisher Serin Books in June. And um, this poem, this is the poem I'm going to read about Blind Garrow. It's dedicated to Phil Cope, who's taken myself and, and members of my family on some marvelous walks where we've explored the history and the present of the Garo and imagined possibly its future. The poem is called At Park Kalonlan Blind Garo. At Gurosid. Gurosid was the bardic name for the poet who wrote the words of Kalan Lan. And this is how the poem begins. Location, Blangaru, Bridgend, Wales. Ordnance Survey Grid, SS912947. Rubbing our eyes, not robbing our eyes, at a dragonfly above the Garu source. Spring or seepage, we're still unsure. 
because it takes a hundred springs to make one river. But the people who create the kists and the cairns and the axe factory amongst the thistles and shrooms must choose locations carefully. Rubbing their eyes and rubbing their eyes between Steep Home and Penavan and the Guir and the Gurid for one day only or maybe two in the year the air clears and they find their world is stretching until it is stranger than stranger than Cornwall Phoenicia America and melting because ah melting because ah the psychedelics of sight I'm not asking for a life of luxury because Hale Alexandra and Clown Dione and Studio 18 and Clown Dione and Blagaru Workmen's Hall and Clown Dione and a tabernacle and Clown Dione and the Royal Hotel and Clown Dione an ocean colliery memorial marker and Clown Dione and Porchwen Farm and Clown Dione and Forest View 209 meters above sea level and Clown Dione and Azarati's from Bardi and Clown Dione and Corilla Plastics and Clown Dione and Pak Kalon Lan and Clown Dione for only a pure heart is able to sing this way singing at night and singing through the day language tight as a shackle tying the deacons to their doxology but only sheep's wool on barbed wire now banished like their tabernacle coal the roof fell in if you listen carefully we may still hear grief in its strict meters. Call me to Picos D, and millennia later, the enameables possess names miraculously out of language chemistry. But those places have, have already become ideas in the old geezers' minds, and beyond the beyond, a beach like the chief old geezer's yellow coat. And later, 12 farms are built until the seam coal reveals itself. And then the forests are sown over the farms. Black seeker on their needle beds, beloved of arsonists and the speedway boys. Dragonflies themselves. And now in masks, we drive along Gwendolyn Street and Katie Street and Oxford Street and T. Maynor Avenue and the street parties are full swing and another clear morning arrives 
on our scratch card planet and we stand rubbing our eyes not robbing our eyes at the people knocking off from the parachute factory and the second shift signing on to pack the gorgeous silks walking away and walking home and there is thistle down in the darkness it's raced around us in king edward street and put Khan terrace and i know these invisibles are everywhere but they are still following a leader's yellow coat Phil Cope, the author of The Golden Valley, is present here in the green room in Porth Cowell to read part of that volume. Uh, this section will take about 20 minutes, I think, Phil. And Phil will introduce it and say, I, I would imagine where in the book it will appear and remember, start of June this year, 2021, everybody is able to purchase from Serum Books copies of The Golden Valley. Thank you, Robert. Um, yeah, my book, there it is, that's the cover, The Golden Valley, um, as it says on the cover, is a visual biography of the Garrow where I've lived for the past 35 years or so. Um, the book is currently in its four, final draft form for, as Robert says, a 1st of June uh, Saturn launch. So there's actually still time for uh, amendments. So I really would be happy to hear from you online or live uh, suggestions or responses that you might have. Uh, you know, things can always be improved. What I'll be reading this evening um, uh, and the few images I'll be sharing from the book with you will, I hope, give you some uh, flavor, a little flavor perhaps of the work, which is really the intention is really to provide a conversation within the book between text and image. That's really, I think, what I'm about. So the book begins with uh, a quote, which I really like, from John Berger. He writes, A friend came to me in a dream from far away, and I asked the dream, Did you come by photograph or train? All photographs are a form of transport, and an expression of absence. Here's a little then from the book's introduction, uh, a chapter I've called A Hundred Springs. If you search for the source of the river Garu, you'll be disappointed. Just like the profusion of events that have contributed to the often troublesome history of this small valley, Avon Garu has countless origins. Flowing from scores of springs high up on the slopes of its surrounding hills and joined by dozens of tributaries, the Garu's brief journey terminates at the confluence with its much broader chested neighbor, Avon Ogur, the river Ogmore just beyond Bryn Garu House and Park. But along the Garu's six-mile fall, it babbles a rich library of tales. Some begin at the time of the formation of the coal measures millions of years ago, or at the land's later sculptings by the river's constant undercutting of the softer rocks that determined the Garu's fundamental topology, making this 
one of the steepest sided valleys in South Wales. It passes along the way stone and bronze age presences in an area once rich in native trees roamed by bears, wolves and foxes, deers and red squirrel. Its main river and tributaries filled with salmon and trout. We'll hear the faint memories of the monastery or Llan founded by Saint Kainor in the 5th century, leading then to the naming of present-day Llan Gaina. And of the 12th century Norman church built, dedicated to Saint David in Betus, itself raised on much earlier Christian foundations, both of them sitting like spiritual sentinels high up on either side of the lower reaches of the Garu. The river flows on below Tinton Farm, the birthplace of Richard Price, the Apostle of Liberty, and runs beside the home of Daniel James, who we've already heard about while living in the Garu, penned the poem that was to become the celebrated hymn, Kalon Lam. And it might even breathe in something of the spirit of the great educationalist, suffragist and Labour Party activist, Fanny Margaret Thomas, known in the valley as Fanny Bloomers for her radical motorcycle riding attire. Dominating much of our history, of course, will be the rough carvings into the land's skin for coal, following its ex exploitation on an industrial scale in the light, late 1850s. And then, within less than 100 years, the dangerous trade's demise. The rivers and the streams today run through the work of the reclamation schemes of the late 1980s and early 90s, which modified some of the water's courses, creating lakes, and pushed the landscape a little way towards a quieter green, though never really fully managing to erase all of the scars. What we see today and what the Golden Valley in turn interrogates, laments, and celebrates is the result of this millennium, millennia long dialogue between the forces of nature and of humankind. The landscape's artistry has been partnered, compromised, and sometimes insulted by human industry and greed. All of these multiple shades of experience and meaning piled layer upon layer in what Robert Minhinnick in his poem at the Cairns above Blind Garrow, which you heard earlier, described as the psychedelia of sight. The next bit then I want to share with you is from a chapter entitled Comradeship and Suffocation. A Brief History of Mining. Although digging for coal had been practiced on a subsistence level for millennia, it was not until the 19th century that our hunt for this black gold was raised to a hellish scale. In 1851, the valley had just 78 inhabitants, all engaged in farming. Their peace was soon to be shattered, of course, by the violent quest for coal to fuel the world's first industrial revolution. During the years that followed, thousands of men and their families poured into the area, speeded by the laying of the Garrow Valley branch line uh, from Bryn Menin in 1872 and the building of hundreds of homes to shelter them. By 1891, in excess of 6,000 people were crowded into the upper reaches of the Garu, 
a large town's worth of people crowded into a narrow, narrow rural valley. And this number itself was to more than double by the end of the decade. Pits sprang up at the places where coal was easiest to reach. And schools, churches, shops, pubs, and workmen's halls and institutes were built. The valley's once rich flora was trampled, its fauna mostly expelled, and its, its fish stock choked in a soup of chemicals and coal dust. This was the time of the fiction of early promises when the uncomfortable compromise between the necessities of finding paid work to feed and house your family and of safety, economics versus well-being, replicated for many, I think, now during COVID-19, released the floodgates to human danger and to the despoliation of the land. The coal industry throughout South Wales thrived, making huge profits for its owners, though not without tragedy for its workers. Mining was, of course, a dangerous occupation, especially in the early years. A significant number of men being lost to coal's exacting extraction each and every year. And for those who avoided the explosions and the regular rockfalls, there were the lingering horrors of silicosis and pneumoconiosis. Here's a quote from an interview from William Gibson, a local resident taken from the Valley's autobiography, A People's History of the Garrow, Clinvey and Ogmore Valleys, which uh, a book I pulled together back in 1992 while running Valley and Vale my reason for finding myself in the Garu. Ted, my other brother, died full of pneumoconiosis. Chock-a-block he was. He didn't have a bit of wind. He was full of it. Ted was young. 42 he was when he died, and he left seven kids. Nothing for it. No compensation then, see? The Garu as one of the smallest of South Wales coal mining valleys, never experienced the disasters comparable in terms of losses of life to places like Kilvunnith, where 276 men were killed in 1894, or Singenith, with 439 dead in 1939, or indeed Aberfan, where 116 children, 28 adults, were buried beneath the colliery spoil which engulfed the village school in 1966. But two hours after midnight on Friday the 19th of August, 1899, 19 men and boys were killed in an expo explosion that devastated the Hlest number three colliery halfway down the valley. An accumulation of gas had been ignited by a naked flame in what the Western Mail at the time described as a baptism of fire. Here's two more quotes from the Valley's autobiography book, this time from uh, Lewis Thomas and Bryn Price. It was nothing to see two or three funerals a week, see them walking down, carrying the coffin, well, it was part of our living. And boys that were killed had nothing. A horse was valued at 50 pounds, but the boy was not valued at all. But it was these life and sometimes death experiences that coal mining presented alongside the distinctive snaking ribbons of houses, the pithead baths, the winding gear silhouetted against the night sky, the male voice choirs, and the miners' black faces that helped to forge another of the South Wales Valley's identifying marks. 
the solidarity of its people. Oppression, of course, can create a dog-eat-dog -dog mentality. In the Garu, as in other valleys, it generated a unity of effort to help each to survive, as well as to imagine and to build in microcosm at least an alternative reality to raise one's community above the always inequitable, often inhuman realities of daily life. So there were theatres built in the Garu, like the Hippodrome in Ponticummer, later known as the Rink, famous for its roller skating and the visit once of Stan Laurel of Laurel and Hardy fame. This was one of four theatres in our tiny valley, and there were four cinemas too. The world-famous Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, once performed in Blandy Park, complete with red Indians, a dancing bear, and an elephant kitted out in the regalia of the Indian Raj. Blind Garu Dramatic Society was one of the best in the country, touring widely throughout South Wales and beyond. The male and female voice choirs and silver bands flourished. Ponticummer had its amateur operatic society, Pantygog, its tint and players. But I think the most significant of the Garu's humanizing tendencies was the construction of the Workman's Hall in Blind Garu and the Institute in Ponticummer, paid for entirely by contributions from miners' wages. These provided places to celebrate local and national culture for political education and for the exploration of different ways to live. This is Bryn Williams, again from the Valley's autobiography. Half of them had had no schooling. Few of them had seen very little daylight, but their education was wonderful. And it all went back to the privilege of reading in the library of Blindgarrow Hall that the miners had provided for the workmen and the little boys like myself to better ourselves in the world. Ivan Novello, the Welsh actor, singer and composer, appeared as a boy soprano at Blindgarrow Workmen's Hall. And there was the regular diet of the latest plays and musicals. This is a wonderful account, I think, by, uh, of Jack Jones, the minor playwright and novelist, who was also the secretary of both the International Miners Lodge and Blind Garrow Workman's Hall, recalled here by local man Grafton, uh, Grafton Radcliffe and extracted once again from the Valley's autobiography. He writes, Jack didn't do things by half wanted the Edward Dunstan Shakespearean Company at the hall, a top company, ranking with the RSC and the old vic of today. They quoted him a fee of £800 for one week. A man's wage in the colliery in those days was £2, so £800 represented the wages of 400 men. An unheard of sum, Jack accepted. They did, the, they did a performance in the morning at half past ten for the afternoon shift, one in the afternoon at two or two thirty for the night shift, and another in the evening at seven o'clock for the day shift. The price of the seats was just threepence, sixpence, and ninepence, and they made money, showed a profit. They packed the theatres out to see Shakespeare. Shakespeare made money. Large libraries and virtually every daily newspaper and journal published in Britain were available to read in these innovative centers based upon the self-education and enlightenment principles of Llangyna's Richard Price and those that followed him. And out of the valleys which uh, the values which underpinned the Workmen's Hall and Institute movement also arose the Medical Aid Society, similarly paid for by contributions from miners' wages. 
collected in order to provide access to a doctor, to medicines, for an ambulance to and from hospital, and a bed at any time at Cardiff Royal Infirmary. These ideas were eventually to crystallize in the establishment of the National Health Service in July 1948. In the early days, coal mining did provide plentiful, though perilous, work and often good pay, but this was not to last. The recessions, the strikes, and the, lock, the lockouts of the 1920s and 30s were responses to the industry's steady decline, following an increasing substitution of oil as the principal fuel and a rise in overseas competition. Between 1921 and 31, the Garus population fell by 23%, and it was often the youngest and the strongest and the brightest who left, a continuing story to this day. Though briefly revived by a new demand for steam coal during the Second World War, the last pit, the Ocean Faldi, was closed in an act of political vengeance by the Thatcher government in December 1985 after a final bitter strike. Its workers and their families were severely punished for their offence of solidarity against all of the odds, and a brief, though momentous, era in the life of the Garu came to an end. I'll stop there for now um, with a little more coming later, if you can bear it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil Cope. As Phil says, he'll be back after the, the interval with another instalment from the Golden Valley, um, bringing up the conclusion to this half of the proceedings from the Green Room is Paul Woodford, who will be showing some of his films, which he will describe to you himself. So to the microphone, to the auditorium, to the Kloiban to the stage, please step, Paul Woodward. Hi. Um, well, I'm going to show you are visual poems. They are filmic, but visual poems nonetheless. Um, I, I say poem because I have to state straight away, that I've got no interest in the relationship between a poem and its author, none at all. My interest lay entirely in the relationship between the poem and its consumers. So to that end, uh, the first five visual poems you will see have a supporting text, what I'd like to call an inoculation. And even though these texts have the feel of poetry, they are constructs or possible deconstructions. Further, the text may or may not reference the images. The whole performance is a fictive envelope where one red herring swims aside another. This playfulness is designed to cause the same sort of anxiety as a Borgesian book of sand. Hollow structures in salt water flow. Blood, sea, circulation without shores, swimming.
absolutely. Yeah. That's group two, PJ. That's group three. That's group three. See, I told you there were some red herrings in there, didn't I? <laughs> I didn't say it was a whole shoal of them, though, but there we are. <laughs> mm Group one, please, Peter. Yeah. Hollow structures in salt water flow, blood, sea, circulation without shores, swimming. Corroded luminescence, stained crystals, angled, reflecting, an infinity of spectres. From the Codex, the doctrine of signatures, the transformation of birth work. Indifference divides and shapes some murderous aversion, a liquid landscape refuses to coagulate. Breathless auguries, a line of flight.
Thank you, Peter. Okay. Over to Robert. Oh, oh, thank you, Paul Woodford. Um, we're going to have an interval now, and Peter is going to play uh, part of our composition, Josephine Drain, and the interval will last approximately 10 to 12 minutes. And I'll be back bringing something from a forthcoming volume. See you in 10 minutes. I threw a dart at it when me and my wife. I fired a rifle at the prizes with my children. I put a coin in the slots and lost everything. At night, my caravan rocks on its bricks. By morning, the sand has built a reef around the door. In the darkness, I hear its grains on the glass. That's a language I am learning. Brother, sister, do you hear me? I am learning the vocabulary of sand. Repeating it as the nights go on when there's not a sound but sand explaining how one day all this will be its empire and how sand will have taken back everything we have won from it. And I believe it's true. I bet on the white car and it came in first. I bet on the black car and it came in first. I bet on the red car, and now there is only sand in my pockets. 
Evenings, I'm in the arcades. Penny Falls, video poker. I'm there with a gang who always turn up at the same time. We hardly speak, but someone said that down the coast you could play all night and keep on playing through the morning and there's never need to stop. But Finland is all rules. I said to the man in the booth, I said, Mister, I got nothing left. I bet the smoke in my mouth. I bet the holes in my belt. Very good holes those were too. So I want to bet myself, I said. I want to bet myself, mister. Do you know what I mean? Myself. Go home, he said. We're closing now. He didn't understand how serious I am. I'm nothing in this world if not serious. So I watch the wheel where my children sit in the sky and the carousel where my wife rides her painted horse. I bet on the red and off they went. Any other day the red would have won. Now how faint those voices are above the fair.
to the dance, and it went me my wife. I fired a rifle, and the prizes were my children. I put a coin in the slot, and lost everything. I threw a dart, and it went me my wife. I fired a rifle, and the prizes were my children. I put a coin in the slot, and lost everything. Thank you for returning. We're beginning again with Robin Hinnick uh, reading Emily an Algorithm from a forthcoming volume to be published by Sustainable Wales and Parthian Books in November um, as part of the celebration, if that's the right word, in uh, COP26 in Glasgow, the big climate change festival. Emily and Algorithm. Memory, it's the first inheritance. Also, the slipperiest deal we get. But then it is taken away. I remember my daughter's friends coming to call for her before school. Sometimes they trooped inside and I would be suitably parental. Got your books, I'd ask. Yeah, they'd say. Sure? Yeah. Homework? Yeah. Fags? I remember their faces, but uh, wouldn't. I don't think schoolgirls smoke these days, or do they? The lane behind this house was called Smoker's Alley. Maybe it still is. Smoking used to be cool. Maybe it... All I had to do was type earwax problems into my computer. I would be inundated with solutions. Mechanical, chemical, psychological. I mean answers to a real problem. Because I, I couldn't hear, I couldn't hear, or only half hear. I was getting things wrong, you know, mixed up. My daughter said earwax is the first sign of dementia. Can't remember how I cured it, not the burning candle anyway. That was the first boulder in the avalanche. Didn't take long for the other solutions to problems to arrive. Constipation, erectile dysfunction, asthma, anal itching, itching all over, 
memory loss, dieting. Look, in a long life, I've had them all. You do, don't you? Come on. But I remember one of those schoolgirls' faces. Joanne, she was called, as clear as day. We used to say then. And how long has it been? 30, 40 years? Memory, see? Memory. Yes, kind of slippery. At least 40 years since Joanne stood in the kitchen and I asked her about her cigarettes. The face on her. Then all I did was type in Emily Dickinson. I wanted the collected poems. No, I wanted the complete Emily Dickinson. I think I've always liked her poetry. My mother it was who told me about Emily Dickinson. How long ago was that? A century? No, but memory, see? And all at once messages started to arrive. The complete Emily Dickinson. Emily Dickinson's collected poems. Then selections of Emily by umpteen poets, but not as famous as Emily Dickinson. Yes, I learned to love those poems. Yet more important, I realized I'd always loved the idea of Emily Dickinson. That's why I didn't buy the biographies, which were how my mother learned of Emily Dickinson's life. In fact, it was me who took the books out of the library for my mother several times in those days when we had libraries. They still come, those adverts for Emily Dickinson. No, sorry, those exhortations for Emily, which is not a word I would use about the actual poet. Did Emily Dickinson ever exhort? Well, maybe. One of the adverts was for the wisdom of Emily Dickinson. Another, I think, was a poem for each day by Emily Dickinson. I bought them both, and that meant other offers arrived. The secret Emily Dickinson, the mysterious Emily Dickinson, the unknown Emily Dickinson, the reclusive Emily Dickinson, a woman in white. You get the picture, but after a while, it slowed down to one or two messages every week. And that's why I'm here on what used to be the school playing field. The school my daughter and her smoking friends attended. This school had been one of the first to install solar panels. Very modern and far-sighted. As the temperature changed, the school made money from its solar energy. I would have liked to think they used those funds to buy books. Maybe the complete Emily Dickinson, or at least one of the selected. Then a wind turbine was erected on the cricket pitch. Not so great, I always planted myself as a leg spinner who could bat a bit. Summers spent trying to perfect my googly. Now I can't recall how a googly, a googly should behave. Memory again, I've tried all the pills. Of course, nothing lasts forever. 25 years the panels were guaranteed. Now the roofs are covered by glassy junk. Collar doves nest, nest under those panels. As to the wind turbines, it, it was 15 feet of sand in the hollow base. The veins don't go round anymore. The turbine was controlled went from Germany and the company went bust in the recession before last. Sometimes the homeless sleep there. 
I hear it's comfortable in the drifted sand. You know, they're homeless because they don't wear masks. The rest of us grew used to masks years ago. The dune reached halfway up this inspection ladder. But don't tell me about algorithms. They followed me through life. It was an algorithm decreed that I should be the only passenger removed from a KLM aeroplane between Cardiff and Amsterdam. Ridiculous, really, as I had connecting flights to catch in India. There I was with my bags back in the booking hall, stuck. But the airline offered another route via a competitor. And that was how I found myself in Riyadh, beside a golden fountain in the desert. And then on board, an empty dreamliner flying further east, surrounded by sunny prayers over the intercom. The hilarious thing is, I arrived before everyone else for my meeting. Because of an algorithm, I think I've always been lucky, but it's wise not to panic. So, here goes. I take up my Emily Dickinson blister pack, like amlodipine or Viagra or Ast Dovastin or aspirin or vitamin B supplement or diarrhea or diazepam. I paid online and the pills arrived. The driver had two children in the front seat of the electric cart. Skinny tags, but at least that system is still working. So much isn't. These four tablets are four little worlds that mean I will be able to write as Emily Dickinson wrote. This is what the tablet allows. Fantiful. It means the science of creative writing is over. That's what the advert says. The tablets are distilled from the proteins of Emily's inspiration. I owe this knowledge to an algorithm, and algorithms have led me well. They seem to follow me around. The trick is trust. I recall circling the airport in Riyadh late afternoon before landing. Before I took off again on the Dreamliner, such a citadel I saw. What might Emily have made of it, what would she have said? Blazing in gold and quenching in purple. Yes, that's about right. And then the desert night fell like the black stone of Mecca. It's not a suicide pill, I'm certain of that. But everything's a risk. What might I say once I've taken it? And what might I write? I like the advert, understated as was Emily herself, that woman in white. Usually. Thank you. That might appear in the part in book. Uh, publishing conjunction with Sustainable Wales in November, but it will definitely appear in my next volume called uh, The Extinction Circus, which is due not, not this autumn, but the autumn after next. Delighted to welcome back to, is it a stage? It's a stage. Paul Woodford, who's going to be talking more about the films he makes. Paul Woodford, please. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, let's see a few more films now, poems. Um, uh, there are, again, uh, direct exploration of this consumer poem relationship. Uh, the reframing or, or decontextualizing or even acts of aggression against um, works can alter quite dramatically the affect of the work and the work that it might have on an audience. Um, the first poem you're going to see references um, a Barnishing Day incident at the Royal Academy in 1832. Turner, having seen Constable's painting, which was hung very close to his own, uh, was upset because um, Constable had worked vermilions and golds into his midground, and the color, uh, the painting itself seemed a lot more colourful for that. And Turner's seascape looked drab by comparison. So Turner's answer to this was to take a thumb load of lead red, a very strong, opaque colour, and to push it onto his painting uh, on the waves on the foreground. The next day he came back with brush and rag and he turned this blob into a, a shipping buoy. The effect was astonishing because the greys and the greens of the sea and the sky began to sing and even the storm that it depicted seemed more intense. Just please. The words that go with this poem are a direct quote from John Constable when he walked in the next day and saw what Turner had done. He shouted, he has been here and shot a gun. the ghost of a thousand poets and poems remix A soothsayer's prophecy, humbly dressed, disguised as a poem. A poem about the process of poetry.
This poem has three stanzas. Metrically, it runs at 30 frames per second. It has assonance and alliteration. It uses callback. It doesn't rhyme. Thank you, Peter. Can you cue the next group, please? Um, the last three poems I'm going to show you were made in response to a social media challenge set by a Canadian poet with a PhD in practicing poetry absurdities. Um, she called the challenge hashtag changing poetry and visual poets from Canada Australia, Europe, America, China, and Wales, posted work. Uh, the idea was to respond to an image published on the Friday and then to post the goods over the weekend. The image, when it came, was just two words on a page. Colour, fullness. Words printed on a page are an image. And, uh, well, I set to work. All three contributions uh, contain those words. Uh, in, well, they actually contain that particular image. All three of these pieces of work contain that particular image. Although, of course, digitally removed and far from their original state. Where's the first one, please? This one simply called Grey. Fourteen seconds of colour fullness. And the last poem is called Lightbox. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. This is part of the when we get there, the Golden Valley's epilogue. So any biography of the Garu must start not with coal mining, but with these hills and with this water. The land's best conjuring trick is its river always emptying itself, but always full, snaking from countless springs before and still along 
the belly, belly of the valley, taking the sloping land's easiest path, never uncertain in its simple objective, serpent-like in our once and possibly future garden of Eden. Our narrow valleys, separated by high passes with poor transport networks, and in the Garu's case, no passing traffic, set alongside the lack of large areas of ground upon which to build, has mitigated in the past against the kinds of employment initiatives which see the footprints of giant factories as our only solution. But we, I believe, need to be imagining a very different kind of future, one laid out in human trails and bicycle tracks, in accommodation and decent places for visitors to eat and to drink, in Kevin Sinnott's art and workman, workman's hall performances, and in the reopening of the railway, with all of our energy supplied from mounting top turbines, blown by our nearly always available wind. As history has made an about turn in our cul-de-sac home, we're already returning to a more traditional relationship with the land. In a combination of humankind's efforts to say sorry and nature's own unstoppable reclamation scheme, greater celandine and common valerian, creeping buttercup and wood sorrel are flowering like parables through the cracks in Garrow's ruins, suggesting something possible and bramble, broom, and common gorse, feverfew, and primrose are rising up in nature's quiet fight back. Our new lakes are alive again with brown trout and frogs, with dragonflies, ducks and dippers, coots and moorhens, and the always solitary and antisocial heron and a peregrine, peregrine falcon couple make their annual visit in a good year, nesting confident in a wall of quarried cliffs where stone was once cut to build miners' houses. The land has remained, beaten up, of course, its flesh in places gored, but wounds heal. And the days of coal mining are now as unimaginable to most of us as the ages of ice, or those of the building of the ancient cairns to bury the dead, or even of Richard Price or Fanny Bloomers. And even if, after all of our efforts, none of our most recent and dreamed of schemes for survival work out for our complex and contradictory species, no matter. The grass, the trees, the bushes will soon grow high through the windows of our abandoned houses and shops. The bushes will grow high, rising through the floorboards of our churches, schools and workmen's halls, flourishing once again where they always used to flourish. And the extremophile lichen on the rocks of the burial chambers of our Bronze Age ancestors will continue to spread like glorious radiating stains. These, in truth, were always the real survivors anyway, tolerant of desert heat and Arctic cold, of irradiation, pollution, and even being shot high into space. So, coal mining's brief century of much gentler poisonings has left little more than a mark on them. In a 1987 interview, just two years after the closure of the last pit in the Garu, Margaret, Margaret Thatcher proclaimed that there was no such thing as society, 
just individuals and their families, ushering in a decade and more of the politics of individualism and of greed. A similar debate is now raging concerning the nature of lichens and of the myriad other formations of the fungi family. When you look closely at these ancient organisms, it's very difficult to tell if they are single creatures or a vast collective, individuals or one being grouped closely for safety. 90% of the world's plants depend on mycorrhizal connections. Myc is Greek for fungus, risa root, so root fungus, linking them in vast underground networks with nearly every organism, passing carbon, water, nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen, and even alarm signals back and forth through their elaborate circuitries in what Richard Powers has termed an underground welfare state. English botanist David Reed named these fine tubular structures that branch, branch, fuse, and tangle in an almost infinite filigree, the wood wide web, challenging Darwinian hegemony of the survival of the fittest as the best description for the workings of the natural world, as well as Adam Smith's championing of selfish individualism in our human free market. These old, new lessons are crystal clear within the smallest and the largest of things. Intensive commercial forestry practices, which select and plant only what is thought to be the most profitable of trees, expelling in the process most species of bird, mammal, and insect life, and ripping up much of the land's underground communication and support system, have resulted in much less lucrative yields and with much more vulnerability to disease as well as featureless, dark, and silent arboreal deserts. Perhaps from lichens and trees to cities and human relationships, theirs is a more useful way to understand and to thrive within our world. Mutual aid and cooperation were essential for people's survival here when intolerable forces were applied to lives and to the land during the harsh years of coal mining. The construction, equipping, and running of workmen's halls and institutes and the establishment of mutual aid societies were based upon the principle that the health of the individual was more effectively guaranteed by the well-being of the whole, with no one left behind. In this cooperation for survival model, paralleled, parale paralleled by what we are learning about the reciprocity and even altruism of the superorganism of forest and field, the healthy paid for the sick, the working for the unemployed. And it is this spirit that is being recalled in some small ways in our communitarian responses to the new realities of the COVID pandemic, which only a united co-evolutionary response will defeat. A reaction which begins perhaps to track a faint path towards a new future for the people of the Garu as well as everywhere else. The coal which brought droves of men and their families to this tiny valley a little over a century ago took 250 million years to create. While decaying trees and plants were swamped and compressed 
every 20 feet of vegetable debris producing just one foot of coal, it took us less than 100 years to exhaust it. In response to this and much other alarming evidence, and in the knowledge that we have now entered the Holocene age, the sixth mass extinction period of our planet, American mycologist and entrepreneur Paul Stamets in his March 2008 TED talk asked his audience, if there was a united organization of organisms and every organism had a right to vote, would we human beings be voted on the planet or off it? The lichens and the rocks of the Garrow Valley, its rivers, trees and hills, its birds and fish, its animals, insects and fungus will win. Always were winning, really, despite the appearances. After taking their beating, it's clear that the earth is blooming again, one blade at a time through our detritus of brick and coal and iron. And as the sun continues to rise and fall over our golden valley, the only real question for us today is whether we will decide to throw our weight behind the inevitably victorious team or not. Thank you. The Golden Valley. <laughs> Um, I'm going to just quickly uh, thank everybody, uh, especially the audience out there, whoever you are. Um, it's been a fantastic evening. It's an amazing situation to be in because it's not live, real, but it's been, it's been wonderful. And we've learned such a lot from you, Phil. I've seen such a lot, Paul. And we've heard such a lot from, also from Peter in the back row, and obviously from Robert up here. I've been in the back row eating this uh, fair trade chocolate, which is gin and tonic, dark chocolate. It's very nice. Try it. See you next time. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>